loud enough to you? I'm trying to judge. Yes. OK, so. Um, we expect more people to join, but uh, I think we will start because we we're running uh, two minutes late now. So welcome everybody. Um, I'm Frederick Follemarie from Computing at Goldsmith, and I have with me um, the pleasure of uh, sharing this session with jo Joydeep Patacharya and Raghupati Verkatashalam. Hopefully, I pronounced that correctly. Um, we are all at Goldsmith. We'll say each a little more about who we are, uh, what's our background. So I'll say just a few words. Um, my background is across computing, engineering, and uh, applied mathematics in the past. And I've been at Goldsmith for, for almost 20 years now, and I've worked um, in collaboration with many different uh, disciplines, including visual artists in particular, and I will emphasize that today. Uh, and I'm involved in creating, uh, for example, tools and algorithms at the frontier of AI and machines like robots, and often uh, in discussion and in partnership with uh, visual artists. So I'll, I'll say a little more about that later, probably, or if you have questions. Um, so the way this is organized today is that, uh, again, each of us will say a few words about ourselves. Then we'll go across a few questions we've prepared around the main themes of today. Uh, we have a title again, Exploring Creativity Across Boundaries in Humans and Machines. And there will be time towards the end, so maybe in the last 15 or 20 minutes for the audience to ask us questions as well or, or give their comments. So now I think uh, Joy Deep will say a few words about himself. Thank you, Frederick. Yeah, good evening to everybody. I am Joy Deep Bhattacharya, so I'm a professor of psychology. It's also at Goldsmiths. I kind of briefly, my background is or kind of research interest is we have been working to understand the, the psychological and the neuroscientific mechanism of, of of various aspects of creative cognition almost over 25 years. And I'm also at Goldsmiths almost over two decades. Uh, also for approximately 20 years. Over to you, Raghu. Thank you, Joy. Um, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Raghu, uh, Raghupati Venkatashalam. I'm a professor of economics at Goldsmiths. Uh, my research interests are in computational economics uh, and also on the mathematical foundations of economics, along with um, uh, other interests in history of thought and so on. Uh, my interest in creativity is more recent and I come from, uh, my work is influenced by uh, the work of Herbert Simon, who worked across both um, economics, artificial intelligence and psychology. So um, problem solving being one of the areas where um, these interests are culminating so um yeah I'm, I'm happy to be here with you all okay great thank you um shall we move to the first question we considered um so what is creativity for uh, each of us we'll give you uh some perspective and again uh, please uh if you have questions about or comments on these uh, answers we give. Uh, maybe take notes and, and towards the end, we will have time for your questions. Um, yes, so I prepared a few notes, so let me maybe go through them. So uh, what do what uh, do I think is uh, creativity? Uh, so I'll, I'll read sort of what I've wrote before, uh, try to be uh, short on time. Uh, I wrote, that is which is exploratory, where one manipulates ideas, forms, sounds, language, data, materials, and I think I could continue with the list, and I would underline here manipulates. Manipulates refers in particular to the fact that we have digits and um, so I think that's actually an important aspect for me is that the body 
influence the way we manipulate uh, materials in particular. And uh, this informs the type of creativity uh, we may access. Um, there's also a, a more sort of abstract notion of that which may introduce novelty. So this is sort of a uh, maybe easier to, to, to describe idea, but when there is novelty that we are involved in um, it, uh, bringing uh, to form, uh, we would say there is some creativity there. But even at that level, I think we may consider different aspects. So there is a, a personal point of view. So if you're, for example, a child and you're playing with things and you're constructing things and you're definitely, I think, being creative with respect to yourself uh, and you're exploring ideas in particular, uh, then there's we could extend that to the, the, the group in which you normally associate with or the community. It could be the language community, so you might be very creative with poetry, let's say, in the Anglo-Saxon community. Uh, and then there's uh, maybe the, the, the larger scale would be uh, uh, for humanity as a, as a whole and uh, from a historical perspective as well. And I would say finally on this topic that I see it, uh, the, the notion of creativity as not something absolute. So it's not, for me, it's, it's mostly um, not something like a theory of nature it's actually about humans and creativity. When we talk about it, we are we should be thinking about the fact that we involve humans to recognize what we mean by creativity. So there's a notion of perception, which will relate to psychology and, and uh, what Joy Deep might uh, be interested in. Uh, and so the human is part of the description of what we mean by creativity. At least that's the, the way I approach it. Uh, Joy Deep, do you want to follow on? Okay, so uh, I mean, in in terms of the psychological field of research, creativity. Oh, oh, thank you, Raghu. There. So, uh, what I was going to say that the research on creativity started in psychology in nineteen fifties. Of course, there has been uh, various definitions, or rather, various formulations were prevalent in cre uh, on creativity defining. And I think there is a well-known book in, published in 1989 on creativity and, and the author listed more than 100 definitions. And, and of course, if you speak to anybody on the street, everybody has their own uh, idiosyncratic understanding of creativity. However, uh, uh, now if you ask uh, someone, a psychologist who is working in the field, now we call it, we have a standard definition of creativity. And the standard definitions, uh, you can you can call it a bipartite, means it has either two components because any, for example, any a creativity is a kind of uh, an ability to generate ideas that that are that should be novel or should be original, and also that idea or product should also have a certain usefulness component or functional component. And if you see, there is a cross sign because that means these two ingredients are not additive for creativity to occur. So just the mere presence of novelty is not enough. An idea is, it is not enough that idea should be original. It also should be appropriate in that context, means that it has to have a certain usefulness. And at the same time, just being usefulness is not enough. Idea should be original. And these are the two primary or necessary components of, of this standard definition of creativity. And sometimes a third criteria, that's at the third on the very right hand side, that's a component of surprise. That if it's something, an idea is creativity, it should be non-obvious, it should be surprising. If you already know beforehand what you are, you are going to generate, means there is no surprise, then that idea or that product is less likely to be creative. So. In a sense, we can say we have now have a, an, an accepted definition. Of course, like all definitions, it, it cannot encompass or include everything of a complex construct like creativity, but at least we, in the psychology field, there is an agreed definition that the creativity is a, has a three core ingredients, 
none of this is necessary, uh, none of this is sufficient on its own. So that's where the requirement of multiplication. So all three components, novelty, usefulness, or surprise must be present. So that's the definition of a creativity. And, and, and another, the kind of one of the implications of this definition, so it's to some extent democratize their pro kind of creativity. So creativity is traditionally considered uh, this, if you consider the big geniuses, for example, Mozart or Einstein, that's what the usually the public associate, the highly creative people. But it also, these definitions, there's an underlying implications that everyone is creative. And we psychologists call it a kind of little C creativity. And the other ex end of the spectrum is this big, really big creators of those who discovers that's a landmark discoveries. And that's a big creativity. And this is on a continuum. Creativity lies on a, on a continuum. And the next slide, Raghu, if I just spend a couple of minutes. Uh, so the earlier one, this definition that I, that we, we actually here introduced, this is a very much tied with the next one, please, next slide. Yes. So this definition is a very much tied with the creativity as a product. But on the other hand, as a researcher, psychologist, or, or, or also computational, if you are interested in the process, what actually going on in our mind, or what is going on in, for example, what kind of algorithm should be there, that would lead to a product that is creative. So if you're interested in the process point of view and the creativity, because that's where the scientists, we are all interested, the aspect of how, how it happens, and that's this process aspect, then this product definition is not uh, uh, adequate. Actually, Raghu already mentioned the name of this famous Herbert Simon. He was also interested into defining the process. So here I just mentioned one of a uh, recent, another definition of the process definition of creativity, which is a kind of reasonably inclusive. So this is the process. Creativity can be dis, uh, defined as a process of internal attention constrained by a generative goal, often involving other cognitive, perceptual, emotional, and motoric components. So that means there are three criteria as necessary. So that should be the here, the attention is a very much directed internally. So you are, something is happening inside our brain and, and there is a sum towards mental representation and that potentially lead to the, to the create, that is kind of defining creative process. Another is you itself in this introspection is not just enough internal orientation. You have to manipulate your attentions. So attentional operations and this manipulation has to be done or these attentional operations are constrained in a way to achieve, a, for example, a goal state. And this goal that you'd, uh, this state should be a generative. So you're generating something new, not just regurgitating some old information. So that's our kind of, I would stop here. So from the psychology point of view, we have a agreed definitions, both on creativity, looking from, especially from the product point of view, and also we are trying to define, for example, creativity in terms of its constituent processes. Over to you, Raghu. Thank you, Joy. Um, so in my case, uh, I'm going to restrict myself to talking about an area where I'm not an expert, so it makes it easier. Uh, which is uh, that I'll talk about creativity in the domain of mathematics. And I'm not a mathematician, but I'm interested in understanding how people generate new mathematical ideas. So uh, for me, creativity is the ability to generate and construct something novel of value and has a potential for surprise. So this is in many ways aligned to the way in which uh, Joy just spoke about, but um, novelty may be necessary, but not sufficient. And that surprise element is also contingent on our state of knowledge. For instance, a child may be surprised at something um, at the day arrived, which is, of course, in creative in that, that sort of framework. It could be the same for mathematician, a surprise element, novel theorem that they haven't been aware of, and so on. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to sort of highlight a few things while we are thinking about what creativity is. Uh, like any definition, this is going to be only heuristic in the sense that it helps us or guides us to navigate this treacherous concept. Um, I think understanding creative processes is a very domain specific endeavor. 
for instance, what is um, what is creative for a mathematician, the processes that govern may not necessarily translate one to one with, say, an artist. Uh, so it's important to remember that I think there are commonalities, but there are also specific differences. And in this case, um, Joy spoke about the mathematical, sorry, uh, psychological aspect of creativity, and Frederick spoke about the artistic process. So I'll <clears throat> keep it to um, what could be relevant for a mathematician. So I think a mathematician can be seen as creative in different levels. First, um, as a mathematician, your job or most of your job involves discovering novel patterns, uh, developing new conjectures, proving theorems. In all of these different levels, you can be creative. You can prove a creative theorem or a creative approach to proving a theorem, uh, novel conjectures and so on. And there are also distinct layers to creativity. I think um, Marcus de Soto talks about it. Uh, one part of it is it's about creative search and exploration. And there is also a combinatorial aspect of creativity, which is combining different things and producing something new. And the third one, which is also the most difficult one, in my opinion, is the creative reconfiguration, which is also transformative. In, in other words, re, uh, reconfiguring the narrative, posing the problem in a completely different way that is, um, that's going to change the way we look at um, mathematical problems. So I'll stop there and uh, I'll uh, go back to Frederick for the ne next question. Next slide now, Raghu. Yes, can a machine be creative? Thank you. Uh, okay, so in short, I would say yes. Now, uh, just to say a little more about that. Um, first, if you look at the question, now it's not the term creativity that we focus on, uh, sort of as a concept, but actually this is about an action, be creative, so it's a verb. Um, so it is about the, the, the process aspect that I think Joydeep was emphasizing just, just a little bit before. Um, and if, if I reread the definition I, I was trying to get at before, so I, I, I wrote that which is exploratory, where one manipulates ideas, forms, sounds, language, data, materials, etc. So if you, if you replace one by machine, um, I would say this is about the, the action and the process which engages you towards towards uh, being creative. And so from my point of view, I would say yes, a machine can be creative. Now, there are limitations with respect to the human, how human judges uh, creativity, which is a, another type of question we'll address soon. Uh, but the limitations of the machines are present if you compare to the, the, the human uh, in the loop. Uh, so in particular, machines today still have strong uh, recognition uh, limitations. Uh, and by that, I mean uh, notions such as appreciation. Can a machine really appreciate what it produces? Can it, can it have a feelings, uh, sort of an emotional response? Um, towards uh, what is produced, if we think again, maybe more of an artistic outcome. Uh, so these are open questions. And at the moment, we would say, no, the machine doesn't have these capacities yet. Uh, still, it can produce some novelty. It can create surprise. Um, and then there's another aspect to that, which is important, which is int intention or motivation. So for the time being, even if we consider the uh, sort of uh, sophisticated results we see in the media every day about, let's say, AI applied to uh, artistic outcomes, images, videos, sounds, etc. The motivation, the intention is implicitly uh, coming from the humans. The humans are creating the inputs, are sort of judging and deciding what to keep, uh, how to uh, tweak uh, the tools. So the that aspect uh, involved in um, the, the full creativity loop, let's say, is still missing. Uh, 
so yes, but uh, there is room for uh, exploring other aspects. OK, I believe it's my turn then to answer, uh, kind of respond to this question again from psychological point of view. Can a machine be creative? Uh, well, as you know, scientists, we are too bogged by definition. Depends on the machine and depends on the creativity definition. If I accept standard common sense definition of machine, for example, algorithmics, AI, computers, robots, that's the definition of machine and the creativity, as I just mentioned earlier. So if it's just a ability to generate novel, functionally useful ideas, if that's the definition, then yes, actually machine can generate uh, create creative responses. Say, for example, uh, if we administer the standard creativity divergent thinking task, which is often used, which is like sometimes shown a common object, and the task is to generate different novel usage of, say, for example, this common object of a pen. So what you can think of this usage of a pen other than writing, okay, creative, and then those responses can be judged later on, originality and, and how you, and other factors. So if if this task is performed, uh, uh, and, uh, sorry, the, this one, yeah. If this task, for example, this prompt is given to say, current chat GPT, and if you, uh, those were kind of rated afterwards, uh, there has been recent studies which compare these, for example, current chat GPT-3 or chat GPT-4 with the human responses. And, and on average, actually, machine performs unsurprisingly uh, better than the average human responses to the same task. So now you can say, oh, wow, the machine is more creative. Yes, statistically, of course, machines, the variations would be much less compared to, for example, variations that we can uh, expect in the human responses. But there are certain twists. Interestingly, so the early research suggests that although this average originality of, of uh, these responses in a standard creativity or divergent thinking task of uh, these machines uh, are better than average human responses, but in terms of if you look at the top quality responses, still humans outperform. Uh, uh, so there are still the highest creative responses still the machines okay even in those standard routine tasks machines haven't yet reached this really really top uh, level um, resp creative responses uh, that are generated or that are provided by for example humans so in a short form just agree with with what what already said by Frederick, yes, here also standard definition of creativity machine can, uh, uh, if I apply that, machine can be creative. However, we know that we humans, we do not, we feel uncomfortable uh, whenever uh, we, anything that we can be equated with machine. So psychologists are no exceptions. So once, I mean, in the recent, I mean, especially in the last six, seven months, okay, there has been a, quite a bit of discussions uh, in the psychological domain or psych among the psychologists or researchers working in the creativity. And there has been two new addition of two new criteria of the definition of creativity. So these two criteria, one is the, called the authenticity, another is the intentionality, which is intention the mentioned also by Frederick. Authenticity actually implied that a creator, whatever is expressed, that is the true expression, truly an accurate expression made by the creator. So a creator is being authentically expressing himself and herself. And of course, that cannot be applied to a machine there. Another aspect is this intentionality, the creator, there is an intention behind creating. It's not, we are not talking here about accidental discoveries. So there is a serious motivated intention is there. And if we apply, of course, these two criteria, additional authenticity and intentionality, of course, if from that point of view, a machine cannot be considered a creative. Machine can generate, if you ask them to generate original, clever responses, unusual responses or unusual ideas, but those we can never claim they're really an, an accurate, honest reflection of the machine's intention. So if you bring these kind of, uh, additional aspects of, of this kind of process aspect 
then machine is still not there yet because now we are entering into this domain of intention, feelings, consciousness. We all know these are important, critically relevant for creativity. And of course, that's an, another, for example, another very big domain or kind of big question unresolved. Is the machine conscious? Can the machine feel? Because we know from human perspective, feelings, emotions are very, very important in our honest expression of our inner self. And that usually decide one of the deciding factors of the creative quality. Of course, we cannot say those attributes or those things to the machine yet. Over to you, Raghu. Thanks, Joy. So, um, Joy mentioned very interesting stuff, and also Frederick. Um, I think, from my perspective, I want to define what I want to restrict a machine to be. In this case, I would simply, uh, for the sake of uh, you know the domain which I'm interested in, which is mathematical creativity. Um, I would define machine to be a digital computer. Not that analog computers are not important or uh, robotics is doesn't have a role to play. But I think um, this is, as far as I can see, this is the most um, you know most core concept of um, uh, machine creativity that we are interested in. Can a machine be creative in some way? Yes, um, for sure. But uh, the question is, in what way? Some in, in all ways compared to a human? Maybe not. Is it creative in some way? Certainly. So the key, in my opinion, is not to confine what we call as creative machines to very narrow structures. For example, most of uh, human history, the way we have done mathematics is, is through, um, through human intuition. What did we do? We uh, form small, um, you know, predictions, and then we routinely verify them. We call them theorems, and the way of verification or establishing that veracity of the claim can be seen as a proof. And then these sort of communicable notions, that, namely theorems, um, are then built upon to form an edifice of mathematical structures. So for most of history, this is the way we have done. Um, mathematics. But now, in the last century especially, you can see that computers are increasingly being used. For instance, one of the things that I um, I think the first novel way of thinking about it uh, was uh, logic theorist by Herbert Simon and Nouvelle, where, where they programmed um, the machine to prove theorems in Principia Mathematica, and they came up with an interesting proof that was not sort of uh, they were expecting. Similarly, uh, the four color theorem by Apple and Haken used um, computer assisted proofs. And then there is also computer assisted proofs that have a life of their own now. Now, the question is not that uh, they're not one of, can human be creative in the same way as machine and vice versa? They're both collaborative in a, in a very important way. There are limitations to, for example, our imagination when it comes to combinatorial sort of um, spaces, which are very large. And they're, you know, um, definitely machines can and create in a combinatorial um, creativity uh, if that's the criteria. So they will be good at some bits and they will not be good at other bits, just like humans. So I think uh, the question is, uh, are we are we asking machine to be exactly creative like a human? Maybe not. Maybe that shouldn't be the criteria. So um, for a machine to be creative in mathematics, I think we can ask whether they can discover new unknown patterns, whether they can discover novel combinations, and whether they can generate new proofs. I think in the first two, we have already seen a lot of explosion of activity, and I think there is already sort of, you know, um, quite a bit of, uh, work happening there and that sense in the first two bits they're really creative generate new proofs is a little bit more um, nuanced uh, they definitely create um, proofs and in, informal proofs and, and 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 check proofs for sure but I think there is a little bit of uh, distance to travel on that bit um, yeah now over to over to Frederick 
for the third question. Thank you. Uh, just before I, I give some some uh, comments on that question um, for the audience, um, I noticed the, the 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 meeting is set up such that I don't think if you speak we will hear you. So uh, you have a Q and A uh, option. You should see that on the interface Q and A, and this is the place to put your your comments or questions. You, so you can do that as we go along and then we can look at these. Uh, we've planned to maybe start looking at the Q&A part in about 10 minutes or so. So please uh, don't hesitate to put your uh, comments or questions there um, as you, when you, whenever you want, but uh, don't wait too long. So uh, how to judge whether an outcome of an art or artifact is creative? Um, I think there, uh, it's it's a ref, it's it calls upon reflection or ref, being reflective. We need to be able to um, evaluate uh, the outcome of a, of a process and, and decide whether this is creative. And again, it can be, from my perspective, uh, judge differently whether you're looking at from a personal point of view, from a community point of view, or perhaps even from the entire uh, human experience point of view. Um, and also such criteria that we could try to define uh, themselves can, can be from very different perspectives. So, for example, it can be utilitarian, so we've mentioned that before, so it, it might be useful uh, for certain types of, of task or in a particular domain or with a particular goal. Uh, but, uh, for example, a completely different perspective could be aesthetics. Is it pleasing in some way? That it generates some emotional response that that is of interest. Uh, we mentioned surprise before. Uh, so an aesthetics uh, in the world of uh, art uh, discussion, uh, philosophy of art is a sort of an open area. So uh, if we have all kinds of ideas about what aesthetics means, but don't have really uh, a single or simple way to describe that, um, how how are we going to talk about appreciation from a machine point of view. I think these are sort of the challenges and the, the big questions we face uh, when we try to build uh, systems that uh, show creativity. So how to judge, again, is uh, for me a sort of, I don't have a, a real concrete uh, solution there, but it's more, uh, I see it more as an open, open question and a, an area of, uh, which is challenging and interesting. So maybe Joy Deep. Uh, there may be one slide is there. I just briefly prepared. Uh, maybe there is a slide. Uh, Raghu, uh, thank you. Yeah, just thank. Yeah, thanks, Raghu. Yeah, I mean, just how how to judge a creativity, work, how to judge an outcome, uh, whether it's a creative or not. So, well, although I define kind of given a, a dry definition of creativity, but you have to remember creativity is always judged within or defined within a social context. So what does it mean? So something which is judged by as a creative right now, that might change. Who is judging context? Context means is the terms and the constraints created by the society. Say, for example, yesterday we had the Oscar. So who decided that this particular film should be highly original, highly aesthetically? I believe those are the criteria. For, for choosing the best films, who are they deciding? For example, the members who are the Oscar or the Academy members. So what does it mean that that's what usually always happens, uh, that any product or outcome, whether it is creative or not, it is predominantly judged, always judged by the humans, used to be, and I'll come to the machine part soon. So the point is here, that we humans judge whether the other product or the other outcome, any outcome or artifacts, should we consider creative or not? And of course, not everybody has the equal voice. We know that how the society dictates, and there certain gatekeepers possibly have a more a more voices. And that where also this lies a little bit of danger of 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 defining something creative. And a, for example, there's a famous say, 
impossibly aware of it. Consider the famous example of Vincent van Gogh. So during his lifetime, he struggled to sell even a single painting because at that time in the art history, in the world at the time, nobody considered his work valuable enough, creative enough. But now there each artwork possibly sold in tens of millions of dollars. And now we consider it's a highly creative, highly original. So there is this aspect that this creativity is always defined with an interactions with the society. So we call it a trio interactions, the creator and the process that's going on inside the creator and the society. This potential, this triangular interaction that define whether a, an artifact or outcome or idea or a product would be considered creative or not. So that's a very much all here, the humans are involved. And now question is, can a machine does or can do this judgment as well. Again, just, just to keeping it in a kind of a simplified format. So if we go back to the sum of the key ingredients of creativity, it's originality, usefulness, whether it's something surprising, can machine do that? Actually, there has been quite a bit of work. Originality, yes, machine can, can actually provide a judgment whether an artifact is original or not, depending on what kind of training data set you use. To some extent, machine also can give you or can provide a judgment whether this product or this idea is useful in that context. Surprise that we consider usually is a very much human attributes that you find it something surprising. And now the question is, can a machine does that? Can, can a machine do that? This surprise judgment. Uh, in fact, actually, they can that given again, depending on the, uh, the, the training data, depending on what kind of algorithms we fit in, because whether a particular idea or particular product is violating the norms or how, whether depending on the, if you, for example, creating, or if you kind of formulate information theoretic terms, machine can do. And actually there has been, a considerable advancement is done, especially in terms of computational modeling of music, language. They, depending on in the information theoretical framework, a machine can tell how likely or what is the probability of this particular piece of music in terms of how probable it is given the context. And that would kind of indicator of surprise. What about aesthetics? So of course we have our own intuitive understanding of what is beautiful. Can a machine do that? That is, to my knowledge, is not there yet. However, however, I would not rule it out entirely in the future, whether uh, in the given a certain constraint, whether machines can be trained or to give a certain aspect of aesthetical rating. But again, it depends on the type of training, depends on the culture, depends on the context, because these all feed into our individual aesthetical response. And the last two points I mentioned, this authenticity and intentionality. How can I tell that this artwork is a really authentic expression of the artist? That's machines. There is no way I could see, okay, uh, in the current framework, a uh, machine can do. Even the humans, we also struggle to have a very definitive conclusion that when we see, for example, and an, an, a product or an idea, how can we, as I say, just by looking at the product without having a direct interaction with the creator behind, that this is really an authentic in, uh, an expression and, uh, or an intentional, uh, for example, an outcome of a motivated intention of the creator. That's possibly only can be done by human interaction with the creator. And then only we can have a kind of inference that whether this I output or this product or this is really an, an honest reflection, an authentic reflection of a create of the creator behind the, behind the created output. And I don't think machine is there yet. Uh, because then you do need uh, an, an, a machine which has a really a conscious being that can have a real interaction with a creator. So there I would uh, really have be doubtful in the current that whether the machine would be ever developed uh, to make those kind of judgment. So there I would stop. Over to you, Raghun. Thank you, Joy. Um, so 
in terms of how to judge, I think the, the question of judging um, creativity in mathematics is maybe slightly different um, compared to other social situations. So like I said, mathematics has so far largely been about deriving theorems from a set of you know, definitions or axioms and you choose a particular framework of logic. It doesn't have to be classical logic. It could be non-classical logic, whatever. And then you derive these theorems and that's been largely, I mean, I'm caricaturing it, but of course that's um, largely what mathematicians tend to do. <clears throat> uh, Ruel, who's a, himself a very famous mathematician, asked this question, if there were to be an artificial mathematician, let's say we can endow the computer with, with uh, all the knowledge and ask, you know, create some kind of a learning algorithm where it learns from itself, take intelligent guesses and so on, and um, let it evolve for, let's say, I don't know, like genetic algorithms or something else, but evolve for many, many generations. And what kind of mathematical knowledge will be produced? And um, so that's an interesting question. And the reason why it's interesting is because it put, puts the notion of judging quite at the center. So it could be the case that those machines could pre produce what are known as true statements in mathematics and also proofs which are unreachable by humans but are comprehensible because so far we have been using uh, mathematics in a in a very sort of a explainable way so you have connections between theorems which are in turn used in different proofs to uh, explain why certain things are related why certain mathematical structures are of uh, of how particular properties. Now, it could also be the case that you can have true statements. That is, this machine can produce true statements, create true statements, which are mathematically true, but the way it arrived at it, the proof is completely incomprehensible. A third possibility uh, is that it could create true statements or conjectures, but which are in themselves, which could be true, but they are not comprehensible to human beings. So there are a range of outputs that are possible when you think about creativity with machines in mathematics. And in, in some of these cases, it's not easy to judge whether something is creative because it goes beyond our, um, our you know, ability to, to make sense of these things. But like I said, going back, it has to have value when, when human beings are interacting with these machines, some of these novel insights should have value, uh, else it is very hard to understand. Novelty alone is not a precondition to be, it is necessary, but not sufficient to be creative. And the second thing uh, to think about is, you know, when, when people use adversarial um, machines now, they are in effect judging the, with some or other criteria, whether something is a particular, um, Kind of, I don't see a possible reason why a priori we have to rule out that machines can't be creative. But anyway, I'll stop there and um, we'll go back to uh, the next. Thank you. Uh, I think we, we could actually uh, very quickly move to the questions from the audience because we have quite a few now. I think they're interesting. Uh, but I just to address actually some of the points that are raised, if you could show the, the second video I had prepared, just I, I would like to just put that. It's not very long and it will give some perspective. So yeah, this one. So if you could run it. So this is for me an example of a collaboration between here a human artist and a machine that can also behave as a visual artist. So this machine, which uh, the first versions were actually created at Goldsmith, it was a collaboration between myself and Patrick Tresse, who used to be a student here. But what you see here is uh, from about 2018, and it's a system that has um, capacity to observe what was initially given by the human. So the human traced a few outlines of a portrait, and then the machine is able to uh, complete, in a way, the portraiture with their own ideas and styles. And there's a camera which keeps looking at the um, outcome uh, along the along the way. So there's a notion of a process. The camera, the the system is influenced by what it's doing, and this is sort of a, trying to get to the 
some of the capacities of the human to be influenced uh, in the process of um, uh, creation, which may be an aspect we, we haven't really covered yet, the, the aspect of feedback and how you start with a goal, an idea, uh, an intention, and you end up somewhere completely different because as you go through the process, you new ideas emerge and, and there is interaction with the artifact itself. And here the machine can play a role uh, as well in this sort of collaborative mode. Um, okay, so uh, I think uh, if uh, I think we have a bit of time, so we have about a, a 15 minutes or so, uh, we could look at the question. So I can start. Um, there is I can read some of the questions, and we uh, any of us maybe. Um, Joy Deep, Ragu, myself, who wants to take a question. So the first one, I'll, I'll read it, and um, one of us will, will will give some some feedback, and maybe we only one of us per question because there's quite a few now, and we try to answer everybody before the end. So uh, Larisa, for example, mentioned regarding intentionality. Many human discoveries were unintentional, as side effects, results of serendipity. Is it a valid criterion for creativity to have intention, a goal, etc.? So, uh, since I was talking about it, maybe I can, I can give some some initial answers to to that point. But uh, I think any of these questions that I, I've read, the other some of the others, we could have a very long debate, and that's very interesting. Um, well, I would say um, in the human context, in in terms of engaging into a process which we would call creative. Uh, typically, there is some intention at the beginning, but it is true that as you progress through the actions, um, serendipity can can play a role, and often it it is by um, observing uh, the process itself, the outcomes along the way, and um, being influenced by uh, e either the observation of what you're working on or other influences from the environment or other people. Uh, often also the, the, the creativity um, process itself takes time. So there is a time dimension. It can take, you, you, you might be engaged for days, weeks, months. Um, a lot of other uh, uh, phenomena will, will influence uh, what happens next, even though you had some initial intention. Think of uh, author writing a novel, for example. Um, so I agree that um, uh, it is not just strictly speaking, goal-directed. So let, let's take a, thank you for that, and let's take another comment, and either Raghu or Joydeep uh, just jump in and, and take uh, take maybe an answer. So I'll read from Daria, uh, there's maybe two questions there, two or three, two. Uh, what direction would you say creative landscape is moving towards in terms of AI, and what skills would you advise creatives to invest in acquiring to take advantage of new opportunities and the requirements of the times, of the days? Uh, Joy Deep or Raghu, would you like to give some answers? Okay, I mean, I, 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 I can comment on them. I would not consider it an advice, okay, there. So it's, it's a very important and interesting question, which is extremely relevant there and especially in, given in the current opportunities uh, of provided by the recent emergence of for example various uh, artificial intelligence system uh, what directions one aspect i think frederick mentioned briefly what we can uh, cultivate it more so although creativity we are celebrating for example the the huge success of discoveries that comes at the end product, end of this whole process. It's But as Frederick mentioned, creativity is a long process, a create this process underlying. Uh, so what does it mean? Means we celebrate the success, but the most important is there's a lot of failure that we don't talk about. And this failure in the process, that's where usually an expertise is, is actually made and if i remember correctly there is a very nice quotation by by niels bohr a famous physicist and he said 
and an expert is a person who has found out from his or her painful experience all the mistakes we can make in a very narrow field. And, and this is, I think, something we actually can, again, not an advice, we can do even more to take bigger risk to fail. So, of course, in the way, for example, field would develop, we can never predict in what, what, for example, whether in which way the field would advance. But we as a human, we can always uh, make progress where we can show the courage to make a bigger risk so that we can more embrace the failures. And that's actually, in my view, uh, one of the uh, uh, kind of hallmarks of of uh, human cognitions. And this also has, I think there's a one question uh, we didn't, because this, if, for example, if we rely too much on this AI and others, we also lose this, in my view, lose this important aspect of struggle. Because creativity is all about struggles. Creativity is all about being really determined to solve a problem. Again, if you take out any landmark discoveries, it's this, those who are working on this problem sometimes over decades, or years or decades, and they didn't solve it at the first attempt. And, and I think this, this aspect of this great determination, taking risk, taking have the courage to explore. And those are, I think, I'm not here putting ourselves competing against the machine. Rather, I'm just telling having this AI and the new emergence, that would, of course, that they can do a lot of good things in terms of finding connections or data, for example, crunching much better than, than, than we could do earlier. But still, what defines us human is our ability of to explore, ability to to get back on our feet despite the failure and this is where i think i mean this is possibly i'm talking a more philosophical kind of aspects that what that we are good at taking risk explorations and this is i think if we invest more in whatever field that is again i'm not again possibly not answering the question i'm not telling which field we should invest more but rather i'm telling which attributes which features of human uh, being human quality that we can cultivate more and that would actually give us a much better uh, idea as well as better outcome while collaborating with machines to uh, redefine even the what means to be creative that's kind of my kind of philosophical kind of answer to that thank, thank you uh, joy deep um i have a, a question i will read i think this one will be taken by ragu uh, just a comment. I see, I'm not sure if you see us anymore. You know, I get a strange message from Teams, but at least I think you hear us. Um, so can, the question is from Uma, and it says, can creativity be entirely non-human and ends, hence unthinkable from a human perspective? Raghu, you're muted. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. Um, and I think it's a it's a very profound question as well. So I think um, the way the way I think about it is the following. I I think right now. Um, so Stefan Banach is supposed to have said the following. You know, the ordinary business of mathematicians is to see analogies between theorems. Good mathematicians see analogies between you know uh, proofs. Great mathematicians see analogies between, you know, theories, and the most fantastic mathematicians see analogies between analogies. So I think there is a level of abstraction that sort of is inbuilt with with uh, within mathematical activity. So I'm only speaking for creativity within the mathematical sphere here. It is very much possible that that in the ladder of hierarchy we may not have reached a certain level of abstraction for for us to comprehend it but would it not would it not be a possibility one day i don't know but it is true i i, I don't have an answer for this question i, I think it is very possible that uh, you know a, a system which is autonomously evolving could generate mathematics which is incomprehensible to human beings and if it is incomprehensible to human beings 
um, we do not know how to sort of think about it in, in terms of whether it is creative or not. But if you are someone like Brouwer, you would say all of mathematics is a product of the human mind. There is no mathematics outside you. I mean, depending on which philosophical position you take as well, this this question um, answer differs. But anyway, that's that's I'll stop there. Uh, thanks again. Um, yet another question. So uh, we're getting close to the hour and I'm not sure if Teams will shut us down. Uh, if it does, please anyone send us your questions. I'm sure we, the three of us can then share uh, our thoughts and, and answer you back by email, for example. And you should be able to find our emails from Goldsmith's website easily. Uh, but I'll, okay, another question. Maybe we'll have a little more time. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety of losing jobs in the arts publishing sector. How could we approach AI to be able to use it as a tool, but still keep the human authenticity aspect of work? Question mark. Okay, uh, I'll try. I'll, I'll try to give some feedback on that. So obviously, this is a. Uh, a very current uh, topic, uh, lots of worries, not just in the arts publishing sector, actually. Uh, for example, in, in programming, coding, uh, there's a lot of similar thoughts and similar worries. Uh, you can use uh, machine learning trained systems now to um, answer questions about, give me a piece of code that does this and that. Um, I would say, that um, the best way to sort of uh, answer these questions is to explore the technology and the tools, engage with them. So one not very interesting aspect of what's happening with so-called AI uh, tools these days is that, uh, generally speaking, uh, you hear about the tools that are made available uh, so a lot of the work is called to, is sort of labeled open open source sometimes. So even you can see the code, uh, but you have a lot of examples that are actually available. You can try you can try the the, the tools and and judge of uh, what it's capable of doing. So you can actually start to engage with the technology in an easy way. Uh, usually via the internet, you will find applications, and you don't have to be an expert. Uh, and in, in a way, this, this current phase of AI is making available to a lot, lot of us expertise from people where before maybe you had to engage with the niche area, with the expertise, uh, for example, let's say in, in painting, and um, it would be di difficult for you to reach a, a very expert level easily, while here you have some tools that at least give you um, a sort of impression of what it means to be an expert in, in, in creating uh, painting-like imagery. So for me, that's a positive. Um, and uh, it opens up uh, possibilities. So there often, to answer this question, um, I've heard many times now the idea of let's look at the past. Did, did some similar period happened in the recent past and what ha what actually happened to jobs, etc. in a sector. So one, one famous example that maybe is a simplification is uh, the advent uh, the, the advent of uh, photography in the 19th century. And up till that moment, uh, for example, there was a lot of uh, jobs for artists, professional artists in doing portraiture of family, of, of, of people to, to have a record. Um, that you could share uh, with others. And photography basically changed completely that landscape. Uh, but what it what happened after a few years is that uh, the, the, the very idea of painting and what's interesting in painting completely changed and was revolutionized. Uh, so you can think of, for example, uh, Impressionist uh, a few years later, the Impressionist movement and etc. cetera, uh, through the 20th century. So it's hard to, to really give you a, um, an answer on what's going to happen in the near future, but give it a few years and we will see the results. And it's, I would think that there will be a lot of new possibilities that, that, that um, 
are made available and that should be also true in the in the creative sector of art and and even publishing so uh i see that we can still operate so there's a let's look at some other questions um I think there was a question for uh, Joy Deep. I'm just trying to find it again. Uh, yes, there was a question from Alex Pickering. Could some of the gaps that machines have using Joy's criteria be overcome or maybe taught? Yeah, so it's an excellent question. So, for example, some of the things I did mention that machine might struggle uh, right now. So, how to uh, find out whether a painting or a music is aesthetically pleasing? Okay. And if I'm taking an algorithmic approach, that's okay. You need to write a program to, okay, to, for the machine. Then we need to find out first or to why we find a painting. Uh, aesthetically very painting or something aesthetically very pleasing. There has been quite a bit of research done on this aspect to understand the psychological mechanism or also to understand the different uh, uh, componential weighting of how the different parameters might contribute towards the uh, individual's aesthetic response. Of course, we know that uh, it is a very much uh, idiosyncratic judgment decision. Something is highly beautiful, appealing to me it might not be at all anything at all interesting to you. So this how this individuality can then be uh, uh, modeled in a, in, in a computer or in, in a program. There's it's certain extent it might be possible, depending, as I mentioned, although of course it's difficult because my preferences and my judgment is very much shaped by all the memories and experiences I have had over accumulate over the years. And can a computer can simulate all my experiences? Uh, technically, that's not possible there. So absolute individualized way to predict this kind of aesthetical judgments, which is predominantly very subjective, is difficult. However, at the same time, while accommodating all these individual uh, aspects, but still there are certain aspects we all know that across culture or even within cultures, all individuals respond to a specific type of visual as a type of visual stimuli or specific aspect of auditory stimuli, which is relevant for music in a consistent way. So there is a certain culturally universal component or individual as individual universal with a certain musical, say, for example, we tend to consider a piece of consonant music is usually more pleasant than, for example, a dissonant music. Even the infants, newborn infants who doesn't didn't have a huge, for example, musical exposure, they also do respond to the similar way. However, there are, for example, there are certain research shows there are certain mountain tribes living in Bolivia. They don't show this particular preference that we Westerners take it for granted. So this is just to tell you that there are cultural differences. And of course, there are individual differences. Certain aspects of individual differences are certain within a culture. So certain uh, stimulus attributes are processed very similarly or, or lead to very similar way emotional uh, responses that can be exploited and that can be modeled. And there has been a war going on anyway already. However, the other aspects that I mentioned that how can I judge that this is really an authentic expression? And they're go, going into a, a kind of a domain where you need to have an, an, a conscious conversation, a dialogue between a creator and the audience in order to make okay, this informed judgment that is this a really a, a motivated intention behind the creator? Is it, is it a really accurate, honest expression of the, of, is of the performer, of these performances? So that dialogue between the performer and the audience, uh, especially evaluating those aspects, I think that, uh, I don't think this can be taught because this is a very much a, a kind of dialogue between two beings. 
There's a, and and this is I do not even consider this possibly okay. I mean, at least to my understanding, that you can teach or even teach in the sense of you can program something to make that kind of judgment. But otherwise, say for example, surprise aesthetics. I think uh, you can uh, come up with, or I think there would be development in the due course computer programs whose judgment on aesthetics would come close and closer to the humans. But for judgment of authenticity, judgment of intentionality, that would be a much harder problem for an algorithm to crack. That's my okay uh, understanding. Thank you. So I think maybe the last question uh, we can take given time um maybe for ragu uh, uh so I'll, I'll summarize it um i don't think we dealt with this one uh, in terms of impacts of ai again uh would you say that uh we're moving towards uh a need for humans to be become uh expert about a very narrow niche area or rather we will need uh, to actually be sort of multidisciplinary and combine knowledge from many sectors in our interactions with these new AI systems. I think that's an excellent question. Um, these things go in cycles, as I as I see the generalists and the and the real specializations. I would say I think given. I look at computation and computational discovery as as a, as a framework. It's not in itself. So, for instance, mathematicians would be tens of years from now would be taught how to use uh, computers in a way that is sort of aiding their discovery. It's the same thing is going to happen with many of the other domains as well. But in terms of in terms of uh, an approach overall to subjects, I think there is a there is a virtue to generalists, universality, and in, in you know in in a renaissance kind of a way, because I think a lot of these um, creative thinking comes from analogical thinking, transportability across domains and disciplines and ideas, and in that sense, I think interdisciplinarity going across these boundaries usually helps rather than sort of you know. Uh, specializing in one particular area where um, I think computation gives you versatility to take it across different domains. Uh, but I wouldn't I wouldn't advocate for a very, very narrow specialization that goes sort of into um, that, that. I think it's an also a matter of taste, at least that's my opinion about it anyway. Thank you. Uh, and, and I think that's also sort of a current topic these days. We hear we hear a lot about prompt engineering as a sort of new disciplines. I've just read a, an article recently saying that uh, prompt engineering is already dead. <laughs> but anyway, uh, because precisely because uh, finding out that uh, you need to come uh, from a very different perspective to get the most out of these uh, new uh, AI based systems. So thanks, uh, thanks again, everybody. Thanks, uh, Joy Deep. Thanks, Ragu. Uh, thanks the team at Goldsmith helping with setting up uh, this possible uh, interaction and meeting. And thanks for the audience for your brilliant questions. There's still a few questions left. Uh, please just contact us with your questions and, and we can try to reflect upon them and get back to you. Uh, email would be uh, an easy way. And uh, we'll try to have a, a follow up to this uh, series. Uh, so, so this meeting may be turning into a series. We've been talking about it in the near future. So thanks again and uh, good evening to everybody. Thank you all. Have a nice evening. Bye. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Thanks, Frederick. Thank you. Cheers. Have a lovely evening. You too. Bye.